Do you want to start? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for being here um, and talking with us today. I know this leans more towards the psychology side of things, um, but as we're forming Trika psychology and in my own experience of using these teachings and practices, I just think there's a lot that we can offer people here in the way of some view and a little bit of practice together and then answering some questions. Um, and I thought since this is our first opportunity to go online together, perhaps we can take a minute and just speak about Trika psychology and why it's forming and where it's coming from. Okay. Me? You. you? <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, Trika psychology. Okay. So when I was going through my training, um, well, I should start even farther back, but I'll, I'll be brief though. So when I was in university, I was always interested in this stuff and I studied psychology, as you know and worked in a psychiatric hospital as a counselor in my freshman and sophomore years uh, without any um, certification or any license because it was in, I was in that program and that's what they made us do. So I had a big interest in this. And when I got into Tantra and Tantric Yoga and the Mahasiddha tradition, it became really clear to me that the ultimate medicine is to really understand these Tantric Yoga teachings, Tantric Yoga and Meditation tradition teachings we call Trika Mahasiddha Yoga, to understand them deeply, to apply them in your life. And it's a form of psychotherapy. It's just very, very effective. Because as you know, and we've discussed this in the past, I wasn't that happy with what psychotherapy had to offer back in 1980. But I'm sure it's so much better now. But still, I hear the same kind of complaints. It's, it's moving in the right direction, but certainly not what I think um, Trika psychology could offer, which is what? All of the techniques and theories of tantric yoga and meditation about understanding the mind and the way the mind expresses as emotions of happiness or sadness, etc., and how we can work with that directly, on a based on a model that was refined over thousands of years of use by yogins, by uh, male yogis and female yoginis, and this is very scientific because they're up in the mountains dedicating their life to this kind of thing. There's no way that they would keep pursuing this if it didn't work, right? If it didn't give them the kind of healing that they really wanted. So I thought, okay, this is very pragmatic. It's very easy to understand. It's not religious. And I thought this could really help because when I first started teaching tantric yoga, I found that a lot of people who were coming to learn tantric meditation, tantric yoga, were saying things that, that reasons for coming that actually I thought would place them better in a psychotherapy clinic, in yes. someone's psychotherapy practice. And I said, you know, those are nice motives to come and learn tantric yoga and so forth, but that's kind of like base-based foundation work, and you should kind of have that sorted out before you take up these other methods, because these other methods are very powerful, and they could destabilize you. So then I thought, okay, after a few years, I thought, I'm going to take out and extract the theory and the practices that will help people work on their psycho-emotional self to become a good Good, to become good, stable, strong, self-independent authority, all that kind of stuff. This is the birth of Trika psychology. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's jump right into why we're here today to talk about fear. So right. where is fear placed in Trika psychology? Okay. So now I'm not going to talk always traditionally about uh, tantric yoga, meditation, tantric uh, religion, none of that. We're going to go right into uh, tantric psychology, Trika psychology. Okay. So here's the thing, because Trika psychology comes from Tantra, there's an emphasis towards getting at, looking at, understanding, and then working directly with the cause of something rather than the symptoms, right? So in that, in that vein, we can go from there. Now, fear is an emotion, as we all know. In Tantra, in Trika psychology, fear is a thought plus energy. Every emotion... We have 64 emotions in Trika psychology. We don't have just fear, anger, sadness, grief, joy. Like in the West, we have a full range of emotions. And each emotion is said to have a type of knowledge base that goes with it, as well as a feeling or energy base that goes with it. And they're tied together, right? Sometimes we feel the energy first, just the emotion. We don't even know why. I'm so sad, I don't know why, you know? Sometimes we hear, oh, that's so sad, and then we feel the emotion after. Sometimes it's thought first, emotion after, sometimes emotion first. But when examined deeply, 
we will find that some type of knowledge goes with each emotional experience, right? We'll go into that. Okay. So the thought construct, I think we all understand the energy of emotion or what emotions really are. Uh, we should briefly mention that they are chemical reactions in the body, electrochemical, right? So they're nervous system reactions, they're neuropeptides that are produced and circulate through the body, which produce physiological changes. And that's why you feel something when you have an emotion. You feel the pit of your stomach. You feel a flush of red blood in your face, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so those two come together, the thought construct and the energy, the feeling. The causal hierarchy of fear generation is kind of where we have to go right now. Yeah. So for people who are listening right now uh, and you're, you know, a psychotherapy client or you're dealing with some major issues and you don't know a lot about this background and philosophy behind this system, don't worry about that. I'm going to try to make it really clear and really simple. And then we're going to get into some practices after, okay? Awesome. So human beings are innate, innately connected to what we call the base in, in tantric, um, Mahasiddha yoga and so on. The base is an unchangeable, unbreakable, uncreated, therefore unchangeable, uh, extant reality that really is the, found, the insubstantial foundation of everything in this universe. That's the base. Physics hasn't quite got it yet. They've been looking for an equation to cover this for the longest time. It's going to happen someday, but not, not, not for a while. <laughs> but this uh, base, this base that is inherently present in all human beings is what sages would refer to as their essential nature or nature of mind <clears throat> or the realized state, you know, self-realization, whatever you want to call it. So... We are all, we are all uh, inherently connected to this base. In other words, we are this base. We not only come from it, but we are it as a manifestation of the base. The base, which is insubstantial and beyond distinctions of substantial, insubstantial, which will really make your head spin, <laughs> manifest in the world as objects, beings, things, us. So when we perceive, though, that we are separated from this base, which is pretty much all human beings. You know, no one gets out of this one. You're born, you latch on to mama, you're taken off of mama, you cry, and you're like, whoa, what happened? Right? This is everybody. It's a fundamental insecurity that develops. It's a perceived separation from the base when we come into human form because our body, you know, appears to be separate from other bodies. The mother and us were one body, we were one body with the mother, and then we're separated, and so on. And this, uh, five, as a second or third order of awareness, comes out and says, oh, I am different than my mother. Oh, I thought we were one. Now I'm different. At some level, some age, 10 months old, two years old, whatever, that hits. And then we get into the world of samsara because we get into, um, well, let's go slowly. So we perceive that we're separated from the base. And it's not like you, as a child, say, hey, mom and dad, I guess I'm separate from the base. I feel really bad, you know, no. But fundamentally, we feel insecure as human beings. Of course, biologically, we can see why. We're dependent on our parents for longer, a longer number of years than almost any other animal on the planet, I think. We have no claws. We have no fangs. Not very useful, our claws and fangs anyway. So we're extremely vulnerable to all kinds of attack and so forth. So we feel it on a biological level. But there's something deeper than that. that the biological level is just pointing out. This flows into our sense of mortality, of our individual nature and of our body and our vulnerability. We fear impermanence because we have this sense of mortality, because we know that we're an object, right? Well, we're not really an object, but we think we're an object. We think we're a separate object. Our experience of objects through our entire life is that they go away, right? Everything breaks, everything goes, everything is recycled. Even if it's recycled, it's still no longer the object. So in understanding fear, we have to understand all of this. Fear itself is an object. We make it into an object. So objects don't really exist. Only processes exist. There's no time when this bell here was ever just a bell, you know? There's no time where that was just a bell. It was always some 
other meteorites that hit the planet, brought some metal with it, let's say, or some metal was formed deep down in the hot center of the earth, you know, and then it was dirt, and then it was mined, and then it was fired up, and then it was put into a form, and then it came out as a bell. But even for that moment, that's not a real moment in time. It's not, you can't freeze that frame. There's never been bellness as an object. That bell's being played, being played, and someday it will break down again, lose its good sound, go back to the earth and become part of the whole thing again. We are the same, and fear is the same, okay? So we'll go back to us again now. So there's a sense of mortality that we have of our individuality in our body as we get older. Everybody listening understands this. My son was two years old, like almost on the dot. We were at a birthday. We went down to our beach house down in Thailand, brought him down there, showed him a beautiful movie, Buddha's Lost Children. And in it is a horse. I thought he'd love it. You know, father always makes these terrible mistakes. Thought he'd love it, right? We all do. We're the best parent we can be, right? Right, parents, we're the best we can be. Show him this movie. It's got kids who are, who are Buddhist monks that, you know, were really poor. And this beautiful monk in the north of Thailand takes him in and uses horse riding as a way of, like, reaching them. The one boy, his horse dies. My son gets a sense of, whoa. I see him, like, sitting there in shock in front of the TV. And I'm thinking, I think he just cognized death for the first time in his life. It was kind of cool to see. Because those first two years of his life, I was with him pretty much 24-7. I knew what was going on. He had not con cognized death yet. And he sat there like this and he was in kind of shock. And finally I said to him and my wife was there and said, are you okay, Rohan? And he said, horse die? Horse die? He could barely talk. You know, he wasn't even two yet, I don't think. I said, yeah, horse die. Horse die? And he probably asked it 30, 40 times. And I paused the, the television and paused it and and, he, and then he was like, whoa, horse die. And he got the idea of impermanence of the body for the first time. But that was the horse. I kid you not, like 30 seconds or a minute later of him sitting silent and us waiting, like, what's he going to say next? He says, Papa die? Papa die? Because we were really close. He didn't say mama first. like, Papa die? I said, Papa will die, Ro. Yeah, Papa die someday. Not now, not now, but someday. And he was like, oh, no, this is too much. Horse die, papa die. Then he looked at his mama, mama die, mama die. Yes, yes, Rohan, I'll die, she said. Then it was like pure panic because what does it do? It comes home now. Now we, we knew it was coming next. And he said, Rohan die. His name is Rohan. Rohan die. And I said, yes, Rohan, you will die someday too. It's natural. It's okay. Well, that, wasn't, that was, you know, didn't make him feel any better. He lost his bananas. He started bawling and... Oh, man. So then for a few weeks after, every day, it was Papa die, uh, <laughs> Mama die, uh, Brohan die, you know. So we're all freaked out about this. And in uh, tantric yoga sense, this is where the fundamental fear comes. So we have fundamental fear, which is our separation from the base. And we identify with ourselves as a separate individual. And we try to freeze frame the experience of ourselves being a separate individual. But because it will never, excuse me, never happen, we, we develop another level of fear higher up, more surface. A deep level of anxiety, deep level of insecurity, because we know we're going. So we fear impermanence and we try to resist the change, basically, that's obvious. We try to create a sense of security of a self, but the self is just a story. Mm. So this transient nature self, we try to make it seem more real by giving it attributes by making it a story, right? A collection of what? Memories, a collection of expectations, of thoughts, and of course, an attachment to the body as a separate entity. Deep down though, we know that there's no permanent self. That's why we're always getting more Botox and boob jobs and suntans and vitamins and whatever we can do to try to stay young and look young, it's going, man. But we know deep down it's, it's going. But anyway, there's a constant effort to make ourselves secure, to create this self object. Hmm. This is the basis of all the emotional reaction of fear because emotion is a reaction. An emotion released into its essential nature, and we'll discuss this maybe another time if we can, but an emotion released into its essential nature is a virtue. So uh, each, it's said in, in tantric yoga that each emotion is a limited or contracted version of a 
virtue, like a flower wanting to bloom, but it's being held back. So these emotions are like tensions. So they're, they're completely intrinsically one, but we experience them differently through our contracting ability, through our limitation ability, right? Okay. We don't want to go too far into the philosophy. We might lose people that haven't done too much of it yet. But every emotional reaction then in tantric yoga, which feeds trika psychology, is said to be based on the base fear of separation that we perceive, which isn't real. Now, the flip side of this is, as I said very in the very beginning, we inherently, all human beings inherently, innately are this uncreated base. But we have to know how to access that, how to experience that, how to express that. And that's in the beginning psychotherapy. And later on, if people want to go deeper into it, that's a spiritual path. So in the end, every fear comes back to the fear of change, fear of death, and so forth. Um, and that's why I think coronavirus hit home and psychotherapists were flooded with work like they'd never been flooded before uh, because this is talking about real death. You know, the body's really going to go. So now people are like, holy smokes, this is not just a phobia about insects. What am I going to do? So here, the bottom layer of fear, right above we're all one, we have that little separation, then boom, that bottom layer of fear in all humanity is there. Then the surface fear, bugs or flying, I'm afraid of flying or whatever. I'm afraid of getting fired by boss. Those surface ones gave way as Corona dug deeper and people started to hit home that this could kill me. And it hit and shook that foundation of, whoa, my individual nature might be going out of here. And I think that's what triggered almost everybody into some kind of fear that they never understood before, you know? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So having said that, that's basically um, where tantric yoga and meditation sees fear and places fear. Uh, it doesn't see it as a completely useless thing. Actually, I see it as quite an important thing to keep triggering me back to remember that everything's impermanent, to trigger me back to remembering that everything is insecure innately. The universe is insecure if you're looking for objects because they don't exist. But when you tell it to somebody who's really fearful and having you know, emotional reactions and so forth and doesn't have a deep uh, meditation practice or something where they touch that inherent base and know it, this is not advice that's going to help. It's not going to feel very comforting, is it? No, it's actually going to create more fear. It could create more. Exactly. Exactly. So we have to learn to deal with things step by step by step by step, nice and slow. Mm. And I think this is important. And what you're doing here is important with this kind of a dialogue in the first place. So did you want to ask something else on that or should I roll on? Well, I mean, I think it begs the next question, which is what do we do about it? What do we do about the fear in our mind? Mm. How it's manifesting mm. in our body? Mm. What do we do about um, trying to boundary ourselves to not take on the fear of others in the media <laughs> okay so yeah let's go right to now we know what the cause of the fear is we're misidentifying so ultimately ultimate ultimate the ultimate medicine is or the ultimate therapy is we're misidentifying ourselves with transient circumstances including our personality versus who we really are at a deeper level which doesn't change. But we do, all of us, whether we identify at a deeper level or not, we have to have a personality. That's what actually communicates with the rest of the world. That's how we engage with the world and communicate. So an experience of our deeper base can come through our personality. But when we're having difficulties, it's always because we're identifying with the wrong one of the two. Mm. So every therapeutic model and methodology that we're gonna use in Trika psychology will help us understand how to properly identify with ourselves as a transient human being, producing a personality and a character that we use, consciously we use, consciously we inhabit it. And the good part about that is we're not going from scratch. We're not working from scratch. Each of us has a nature, a constitution, a, part, a personality that we're born into. And this is part of our destiny. So, but we can learn how to transform emotional reactions into virtue display, and then we're healed. Right? And that's the journey of trika psychology. So we work where, with where we're at. So what do we do? Well, I think one of the very first things we have to do now that we understand the real nature of fear is not work with each individual fear on the surface as the first thing we do. We can do that. That's useful. But what I would suggest is that we actually start to look at other ways of working with fear. 
Now, the yogis knew that people had to go through these psychological stages before they went into deeper work anyway, a long time ago, thousands of years ago. And they developed uh, Hatha Yoga, not really the Hatha Yoga you do in yoga studios, which is meant to build up a body beautiful and actually gets you more attached to your individuality. When you start aging, you have serious problems and psychoses, right? That's not the real yoga tradition I'm talking about. Now, if you're practicing that yoga, don't let me um, you know, make you sad or anything. That's great for your health. That's great exercise. The yoga I'm talking about, which was written about in a fantastic text uh, about 550 years ago, says that we practice yoga to overcome our fear of death. Now, what does that mean? So my teacher unpacked that for me. And he said, this pithy statement means that you go into yoga to explore your body. So here's one of the first ways I really recommend people get over fear of death. Explore your body. Learn about your body. I was shocked and just reminded again how little people know about their physiology, their anatomy, when this coronavirus thing hit. I was talking to people and they had no idea how it would spread or why it would spread or why they had to wear gloves or, you know, why it was good to gargle with Listerine because it hangs out in the back of your throat for a while before it hits your lungs. Oh, your throat's connected to your lungs? <laughs> yeah, Jim, <laughs> you know. So um, first explore your body. Read about it. Read about it. Look at anatomy books and physiology. And there's some fun ones out there that can make it really fun and interesting. Because we fear what we don't know. Isn't it true? Mm. We didn't know about the virus. And that was already really fueling the panic for everybody. Mm. Right? And as we discover more and more about it, like discovering now that it attacks the kidneys and the liver and the testicles, and there could be infertility problems and all this stuff that might happen as we're learning more. We don't know yet, but we're learning more. Um, there can be more fear because we just don't know enough. So first, have knowledge of your body. Learn how it functions. That's the first thing I would say. And work with your body, though. Here's the thing. Actively work with your body. Exercise. But be conscious of exercising. Use yoga. Be conscious of performing the yoga. I think it's very important that we work with our body because as we do, we explore it, we go deeper into it, and we have a deeper connection to the body, even though it's a transient phenomenon and not really an object, it will start to open to us more. We won't feel separation from it so much. And in fact, we'll start to notice that the, as we become intimate with the body, we'll start to notice that the changes that are occurring in our body are occurring all the time. Because yeah. when you work with your body on a daily basis, you know one day you wake up tight, one day you wake up loose, one day your thighs are tight, next day your shoulders are tight. It's like, wow, things are always changing and moving. I didn't have that wrinkle the day before, now I have a wrinkle, you know, whatever it was. And, and you work with your body and you're so connected to your body that you start to accept this experience that everything's process. That it's not, it's not uh, a fixed static experience. And as you start to let go into everything's process, then everything becomes workable. Fear is the panic of hanging on to that which we try to make permanent, which can't be permanent, remember. Okay, so I recommend people work with their body. A way to work with your body, one of the methods I wanna give you really quickly that's very simple. My first teacher taught me, relax your face, relax your shoulders, relax your belly. So he would have me rotate awareness. These are called second attention in our system. In our system of oral tradition, it's called second attention. Second attention on relaxing the face, shoulders, and belly. So that would look like this. If I'm like in a typical stressed out person, I look kind of stressed out with my eyes and everything, like always kind of nervous or, you know, when I look at when I drive the, the subway in Japan, it's like, mm -hmm. It's horrible to ride the subway in Japan and look at everybody. They're all like incredible faces of pain and agony. So the shoulders are all up, but they don't realize the shoulders are up. The face is all crinkly. You don't realize it's crinkly, especially with fear, like the fear of face, you know. And the belly's pulled in. These are physiological reactions that must occur to have fear generated. What, Dharma? Yes. We cannot generate an emotion without tension. It's impossible to generate emotion without physical muscular contractions. You can test it for yourself. After we come off this session, I, I really highly recommend everybody lay on the floor, completely relax, like a relaxation process, let go of every bit of muscular tension, and then think of something that would give you an anger reaction or a fear reaction. Think of it as much as you want and see if you can actually feel the fear or anger. As long as you're staying relaxed, you'll never feel, feel the fear or feel the anger. And that's a beautiful revelation that one of the teachers taught me, one of my teachers. So he said, look, take your face and let it relax. Let your shoulders relax. 
Let your belly relax. Whoa. These three tie us into three kind of centers of being, right? They tie us into the three core areas that relate to human beingness, the head, the chest, and the belly, the pelvis. So belly and pelvis as one. When we tense up, we usually tense all three. If we can remind ourselves, especially during a coronavirus pandemic, every five minutes, I had a little mantra I used to say, face, shoulder, belly, face, shoulder, belly, face, shoulder, belly, face, shoulder, belly. Every five minutes, relax your face. Oh yeah, wow, didn't realize I was tense. Okay, relax, relax. I was reading, but I was too intensely reading. Relax your, relax your shoulders. Oh yeah, I didn't realize they were up. Oh yeah, yeah, my belly. Let your belly pout out. Whoa, I was holding clean. Right to cut so much of, did we lose our transmission areas? Right away, we're going to lose so much of the tension that drives the emotion in the first place. What does that do then when we let face, uh, shoulder, and belly relax? We can see now the thought component of the fear in its naked awareness just the way it is without any of the emotion being generated. Mm. That really is helpful because if we can see the thought or the story about the emotion, we can deal with it so much better if we're not in reaction. Now, most of us, as we get better at this, we're not going to catch it before it starts. But this is the goal. So we're going to catch it with the emotion going already. So now I'm in fear already. What do I do? Same. Face, relax. Relax. Shoulders, relax. Belly, relax. Take a few, a few breaths and make that a little deeper of relaxation. Okay, great. Awesome. Now that's relaxing. And now I can see the story that's being generated. So the next thing we want to go to is de-assembling, de disassembling the story around the fear. And there are accurate fears, like I call accurate fear, accurate situational fear. I walk into a room, there's a tiger. That fear is warranted. I don't really know what that tiger is doing in my house. A jaguar here in the jungle in Costa Rica, a jaguar could be in the house. They're always around eating dogs and stuff. So the jaguar is a very serious animal, <laughs> you know, strongest bite in the cat world. So I have something to consider there. That's a real fear. But that's an accurate fear in the situation. Still in that moment, I might generate an overreaction, which would cause me to act in a way that would be less efficient or useful in that moment with the Jaguar. In the same way, in the city, you're in New York City, you're in Detroit, San Francisco, wherever you are, or country, whatever, country town, still, you may generate an emotion of fear. There could be an accurate fear about a car that just cut you off or something, but so quickly after that accurate fear or appropriate fear, we generate a story about it. Oh my God, the world's so unsafe. Oh, ah, ah. And we start tensing up even more. And this is a process of emotional reactivity, which we have to try to undermine. To undermine it, the very first thing we have to do is, rep is recognize that it's happening. Okay, I'm emoting. Whoa, I'm emoting. Face, shoulders, belly, relax. That's number one. Okay. Then after that, I have to quickly <clears throat> assess what is a fear that I have to deal with, which is occurring, a situation occurring in the present moment. I have to deal with it. It doesn't need extra hyper action, extra hyper emotional reactivity. Just deal with the, deal with the situation. Even the fear could be re reduced while I'm dealing with a so-called previously fearful situation. But what if there's no um, fearful situation there? So many times there's no fearful situation right there in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Coronavirus, coronavirus. Yeah, before it hit New York, there was no, no danger to you. And in fact, when you're sitting in your house and there's no virus in your house, you're still in no danger. But we're generating fear anyway. Yeah. How does that happen? How does that happen? It happens because now we're generating a story. Because right in my room, right here in Costa Rica, right here, right now, my county just got its first case of corona. Okay. And the difference in town was palpable. Hmm. Now people were freaking out. One person has it in my whole county and they're freaking out. Right. Before nobody's freaking out. Now they're finally wearing masks. Now nobody's going to the grocery store. Like it's a really amazing change. So we're, we have to get with reality. So we relax. Then we start to feel the fear and say, why am I generating this? Who's generating this? What's generating this? Uh, it's a story. It's a story related to myself. It's all about my self-survival. I don't want to die in this case. Okay. Good one. Good story. Okay. The story is that I'm at threat. 
So what I want to do right now is recognize I'm not a threat. I'm in my room right here. I don't have a threat of coronavirus. Or if I'm out walking on the street, I have a good N95 mask or better and gloves. I'm really not at a threat, you know, if I have to go to work or whatever. So in this case, I, I de deconstruct. So I look at myself and then I say, okay, let's take the character out of this story. Let's take me as the character out of this story. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's look at the story itself. No longer me in the story, just the story itself. Okay. So I'm at, at uh, I'm vulnerable to a coronavirus. Okay. Well, what is that about? It's about fear. Now, the fear isn't warranted. In the present moment, there's nothing in this room. Now, let me go into the feeling of the fear more because this is what I have to do. Leave the self, leave the self in the story, the character out of the story, and go into the fear itself. What does that mean to go into the fear? What it means is I start to assess it. I start to look at it, and I start to feel it, and I start to say, hmm, what are its qualities? And this is the very important step. You know this quite well. We've done this for years in practice. What are its qualities? Is it cold or warm? What do you mean, Dharma? Fear can be cold or warm? Yes, everything has qualities. So just sense when you have fear, is it a cold emotion or a warm, expansive emotion? It's cold and contracted. So the qualities of fear is that it's cold. Another quality of fear is that it's contracted. Another quality of fear is that it's very light, movable, light, changing, skittish, skittish, right? And it's dry. So it's dry instead of moist. Let's, let's um, contrast it with, uh, should we do love? So love is warm. Love is warm and expansive. That's different than cold and contracted. That's fear and love, right? Love is not only warm and expansive, but it's considered to be moist and rather than dry. Dry love, nobody needs, right? So it's got a moist quality of connecting through that water element. Mm. So right away, as we paint a picture between love and fear, we can see, yes, emotions have qualitative experience. Anger is hot, obviously, and rough and cutting and so forth. Love is smooth, not rough. It's not cutting, it's encompassing. So these different qualities are there. So we look at the qualities of fear, the cold, the contracted, the um, light, uh, the dry, and we say, okay, I want to feel those qualities without the story. So everybody listening, what you do is you sit quietly, you take yourself as the character, first you recognize there's a fear story being generated, accurate or inaccurate to the present moment situation. You take yourself, yourself that you're trying to preserve this sense of self out of the story, and then you go into the actual qualities of the fear. Let me feel the, the coldness. I feel the cold. Let me feel the contractedness. I feel the contractedness. Let me feel the lightness. Okay, great. And as soon as you do that, while you're doing it, while right now, while I'm doing it, you do it right now. There's no more what you would call fear. You've moved yourself away from the character who has the fear to looking at the fear's qualities, which moves you out of the whole word fear that describes an emotion. And now you're just into sensations. These are the composite sensations that make up fear, but now you're breaking them down into the composite sensations. Once you break them down into cold, feel your cold. You feel lightness, feel the lightness of the fear. You're feeling that you're feeling that we call fear. Right? And you feel <clears throat> the dryness. As you focus on dryness, as you focus on lightness, as you focus on coldness, you're no longer quote unquote fearful. It's just sensations you're feeling. So now you're feeling those sensations directly. And this is classic, classic Trika psychology, Tantra Yoga. I'm feeling just the sensations of the qualities that I used to call fear, that used to be associated with a story that used to apply to a me. And I've moved down the road from me to the story, to the fear, to the qualities, now I'm in the qualities. Okay, now that you're in the qualities completely, this is where it gets really fun. Keep your eyes closed and stay with me just for a second or two. 
Now that you're in those qualities, guess what? You have the ability through your mind, doesn't matter how developed your mind is or not, to change the experience of those qualities right now in this present moment. You can change the coldness of fear to warmth. So instead of focusing on cold now, mentally bring on an experience of like when you were on a warm beach, a sunny day at the beach, or maybe you were in a sauna. You know, anytime you can remember feeling really warm, you, know, you flew into a tropical place and you step out of the airplane and boom, you're hit with that hot, wet air. Feel that warmth. Make believe in your mind that it's there. Evoke it from within yourself. Bring it out. Bring out warmth until you can feel yourself get warm. Now, it's proven that people can do this with no training, just by being talked into it, but I'm talking into it right now. You can feel the surface of your skin getting warmer. You can maybe feel tingles in the palms of your hand as the warmth spreads out. The hands feel it first off, and even the face can feel it. Scalp. So feel this warmth. Now you've succeeded in transforming, or beginning to transform, one of the qualities of what used to really cause you a lot of problems, this thing we used to call fear, now is warm. It can't exist in a warm environment. And now you bring on the next one. Instead of light and skittish and mobile and feeling very moving and ungrounded, feel heavy. Feel warm, feel heavy. What do you mean feel heavy, John? I mean, wake up the sensation of heaviness in your body as if you just worked a really long day and you're so tired, you sink down in your couch and you feel so heavy in a really good way, a nice, heavy feeling. Or when you lay down in bed and the mattress accepts your weight, oh, I feel so heavy. Now you've changed with this evocation of heaviness, lightness to heaviness. Now you're warm and you're heavy. Warm and heavy. Now let's get away from dry. Let's transform dryness. Let's feel a, a sense of moistness. Now, how do I feel moistness? What do I mean by that? A feeling of connection, a feeling of adhesion, a feeling of a fluid, this is based on the water element, right? A fluid sense of everything being connected. So you can, in your mind, you can generate a feeling sense of the connection to the things you love in your life, the people you love in your life, situations you love, you know, when you're at your hobby or your sport club or when you're with a person you love, generate that feeling of connection right now. That's how we move away from dryness into moistness. Okay, so we've transformed like three really important or four really important basic qualities of fear. And now if you're really in those qualities, it is truly impossible to feel fear. You test it for yourself. You can actually actually kind of thought about the virus or whatever else is going to be fear, your divorce coming up, whatever. And you can just stay with those other qualities of warmth and heaviness, expansion, connectivity. And you're like, wow, I can actually see the thought of fear, but not feel it. I am the master of my situation. I'm the master of my mind and my body, my reality. And I didn't have to spend 40 years in a cave in India to get it. This is Trika psychology, right? It's the beauty of it. So this is a very simple exercise, which should be done over and over and over and over. It can be done short or long. You can saturate as long as you want in it. But the more you do it, you set up a pattern, right, Susie, that when uh, some negative emotional reaction is starting and you catch it, you can do this right away and cut it off before it starts. Or if it's already going, fulminating and really going, you can get alone for a moment and sit down and do it you know, in a bathroom stall at work in the office. You don't have to do it in front of everybody. Anywhere you want, you can do this anywhere, on the bus, on the subway. And you can get back to the sanity of the present moment where you're not really being attacked, where there is real no, no victim there, where you're not really any vulnerable this moment than you were every other moment of your life. This is where it is relevant to discuss how people say, look, I know we feel a lot of fear here and I know we had almost a half a million people die already. But more people die every year of that just falling off ladders and falling down steps. And you're not going to stop walking around. So what are we really talking about on a real basis? Well, we're talking about something that triggered your emotions. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, a new thing that scared you. But is it any more powerful than other things that we deal with on a daily basis? No, it's not. 
we just well, make it very it is, it is for some people because I think people are really checked out to what's happening in the world on a daily basis. So I'm noticing that those who, you know, don't pay attention to global events and don't really understand the world at large and globalization are having even more of a freak out because they don't realize that people are dying every day. People are hungry. People are suffering to this degree. Yeah, my wife, my wife, Sukali, and I just had this talk the other day, exactly what you just said. I said, why are people freaking out so much? And she's like, they're so fundamentally disconnected from reality but they don't realize the danger. And this is a funny thing because it's something that we, we often talk about this, like why we chose to live, why I chose to live everywhere I chose to live outside of the US was because it's more wild and woolly in India, in Thailand, even Australia, you know, when I was there way back in the early eighties, it's, it's wild and woolly. It wasn't as safe. It was a little crazier, you know, and we chose that on purpose because it reminds us all the time life is really like this. When you try to construct, and this is something we should all think about, when you try to construct a life where everything that is possibly dangerous is handled to, to the nth degree, oh my God, that's a house of cards. And that's going to collapse, right? So yeah, that's a very good point. So I think this is a good readjustment for a lot of us. Once we get over the, the you know understanding of how to deal with fear and so forth, we'll be bigger and stronger and more mature because of it. And who knows if it'll bring the, co- the world together or not, but that would be nice, but who knows? <laughs> so there's two practices we can do very quickly. One is the face, shoulders, and belly. Do that all the time. Everybody should do that multiple times a day. Uh, I still do it. You know, I've been doing it for, let's see now, I'm kind of old, 45 years. And I still do it, 45 years, and I still do it because it works. It's so easy. It's just a habit of mine now. I actually feel when my stomach is pulling in now before I have to relax. I feel when my shoulders are going up. I feel when my face is starting, you know, and that's why it'll develop that very quickly within a month or two of practicing it. You'll be able to feel that too. The same thing with the story exercise, learning how to identify the character in the story, then the story, and then the element of the emotion, and then the elements of the emotion, the qualities, and leave all that behind, take yourself out of the story, take the emotion out, just go to the qualities of it and transform those qualities. As you do this at home or on the subway sitting quietly doing these exercises, you're developing a very true skill, like a psychic muscle, like you're going to the psychic gym and doing exercises that absolutely will teach you how to do this in any situation in the future. I mean, the truth, I'm going to tell you something true, everybody listening, and you can do this because everybody, I had to do it. We all can do this. I don't react emotionally. I won't react in any situation if I want to. I can just not react in any situation, no matter how fearful. The guy puts a gun in my face. It's not going to make me react only because I've worked this exercise for many years. But now on a very basic level, as soon as you apply it and you start using it, you're already developing the track within you the groove to move away from emotional reactivity into your awareness and your mind, which controls all of your situation all the time, controls your reactivity, controls what you'll think about it, how you'll feel about it. And this is great. And you start this right away. It can be a short one on the bus at a red light. You know, it can be uh, at home. I recommend do some at home every day when you have a chance in an undistracted environment to go into it for five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But pretty soon you'll develop those muscles and you'll be able to do this for yourself. That's brilliant. That's really, really helpful. Um, mm. so do you have a few more minutes? Can we open it up to questions? We do, we do. And then we have the other exercises. Maybe in the future we do another one or something like exercise of centering. Or you can, I think you know centering well enough if you want to share it with people, at least the first part one, right? Okay. You want to share? You want to share it with people on another one? If you want me to do it, I can do it. But I think you're well capable of that. Yeah, let's open up the question. Okay. So you guys, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself, or if you prefer to type it in the chat box, you can do that too. Wow. Am I that bad? Is that what it is? No, I think like that that really <laughs> <laughs> Hi, well, Dharma. It's Eleni Young. Can there's you hear me? Oh, Eleni, you have a question? 
Yes, I just wanted to find out a little bit more about the 64 emotions and how we can, I can explore those a little bit more where I can read about them, find out about them. Are, there any, are they in any of the texts or...? You're stumping me because this is always the case when I come from, I come from an oral practice tradition, right? So we don't have all these books. And now I'm attempting to put all this stuff into book form. Even Susie and I are putting this trick of psychology into a series of texts for therapists like yourself and for um, people who also want to just self-therapize a little bit, help at home, you know, like a self-help mm -hmm. book series. So the 64 emotions, uh, I don't know where you'd find that in the text from the Indian side. I don't know if it's listed from the Tibetan side either. So here's where you may be able to find a little bit more about it. Have you studied the Rasa theory in India? No, uh, I know a little bit about it, but yeah. Okay, so Rasa yeah. theory, you know, they have it in dance and acting. Mm -hmm. most, okay, mm -hmm. from the aesthetics studies. And so here we usually have a grid. We usually use a grid of three by three and nine squares and talk about nine Rasas or nine emotions. And mm -hmm. actors and actresses in India will learn how to bring them on really quickly, like generate them really quickly and move really quickly between them. To do that, what they're doing is the exercise we did. So that whole idea of theater is deeply tied to the early tantric yoga meditation tradition, as it is in Greek as well. Because if an actor, you know, in the old days, actors were considered, really old days, actors were considered like very spiritually evolved beings. And then lately they became just forms of entertainment and not so savvy at all. But in the old days, acting to be able to produce an emotion quickly meant you had to be able to generate all of those qualities that that emotion had. And you can mm -hmm. feel them and generate them from within to be a convincing actor, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you had to change it to another one. Oh, the bad news comes now. I forgot from happy to, ah, uh, and you feel it. And, and those skills are exactly what we're developing here. The difference is we're taking that emotional connection and trying to connect it back, connect it to our base. To understand that what allows us, what allows us to move between this range of emotional experience that we're generating on purpose to learn how to be skillful with it is the fact that we do have a base to come back to. There is always actually an abiding awareness below everything, an abiding presence, which we think in Trika psychology is, is unlimited love and unlimited awareness or wisdom. We, we are that, and that's our abiding base. And that's what allows these other surface changes to happen. So earlier I was talking about, you know, the emotions and that we have um, this base, but that we have these emotions going on the surface and we identify with them. It's a misidentification. Well, part of our identification all day long, we want to constantly remember, oh, I'm something deeper than the waves on the ocean. I'm actually the ocean as well as the waves. But where the waves are temporary and changing all the time, this ocean's permanent. You know, my base is kind of permanent. So anyway, in answer to your question again, and we don't have that I know of. You might have to go search on Swami Google and Nanda to find that one. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, but there are lots of Buddhist psychology books that talk about emotions. They don't list them as far as I know. Okay. okay. Um, no, that's all right. That's okay. Joanna? Yes. 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 Can, every, can everybody hear that question? Okay. She said, can you use this technology to transform other emotions like excitement? What else did you say? Surprise. Anything. Yeah. You can do it to, you know, guilt, shame, depression, anger, you name it, of the 64. You can transform any of them using this technology because this technology is based on how a human being actually is constructed and functions. That's the difference between truth and psychology. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel and come up with some groovy new psychological model of how everything works. The ancient masters of meditation that gave us the system of truth psychology knew the mind. When I do long lectures on this, I usually tell people when they come in to hear a lecture about truth psychology, I always start with my story. And my story of truth psychology is that when I was in university, I finally nailed my teacher down because I had it in high school as well, psychology. I was deep into it. We had a class in high school. It was the first in the country, actually, at the time. And then I went to university. Now I had this guy one-on-one. -on -one. I thought, okay, here's a professor of psychology. He knows everything. I'm going to ask him 
So what is the mind? And he knew me quite well by then. He knew that I was involved in the meditation, yoga, uh, Taoist tradition, all that. And he said, we don't have a clue, actually. He said, we don't have a clue. We have many definitions of what we think it could be. And I said, well, it seems to me that what I've discovered is that you're looking at more or less the negative effects, the negative functioning of the mind rather than what the mind is. So calling it psychology is kind of a misnomer. It's not the study of the mind at all. You're looking at out here somewhere when the horse has already left the barn. And he said to me, which I'm really grateful for, he said, yeah, you're right. You know, your tradition with this yoga meditation stuff might have more to say about it. And I really believe that, that Trika psychology is phenomenal because we do understand the mind. Our masters have taken the mind apart over thousands of years, put it back together again, looked at every combination, permutation, and understand that it's, it's all founded on the base experience that we all have as human beings. So because of that, we know how it works. We know how emotions function. And they discovered how emotions are tied into our virtues. So let me give you the, the example here. If you keep doing that exercise we talked about, where you transformed your fear into the other positive um, qualities of warmth, expansiveness, heaviness, moistness, connectedness, all you have to do for the very last step of this to go the next step and have it be truly phenomenally healing and to actually touch your base is to now evoke or naturally listen for and allow to come forward what is the virtue that comes out that feels like those qualities. And you're gonna feel love. You're gonna feel belonging. You're gonna feel acceptance. You're gonna feel connection, innate connection, not a connection you have to generate. This is the beauty of it. Emotions are contrived. Emotions are contrived self-efforts at creating a character experience in a story. But when you transform that, remember we said it was contracted and limited, when we can transform that, when it opens up into the virtue, like the lotus opening up, that's not contrived. That love is who you are already. That wisdom is who you are already. And in the case of fear, the courage is who you are already within you. And that's the beauty of it. So you can go the next step if you want to as well. That's what we do in meditation practice retreats and so on and so on. Yeah. Is that okay, big one? Yeah. Can I, ask a, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so would you say that those two techniques you just described would be a good entry point for people who have problems with meditating? It's just, it happens that I um, encounter some students of mine who are after a deep traumatic experiences in life. And for instance, they're just not able to meditate at all due to the fact that the trauma hasn't been yet worked through. Yeah. So is that something you would recommend for those people as a kind of first step in the process of healing? Right. When, when, you, when you look at the old masters of yoga and meditation, like these ladies and gentlemen went through hell and high water to finally get to a great master in the mountains and study with them. And as they went through that experience of life, uh, usually between five and 10 years to get to a master and find them. They had to work through all of the psycho-emotional issues that we don't get an opportunity to really work through in our modern culture. So then when we sit down to meditate in the modern culture, we're at a great disadvantage because we haven't worked through the traumas that you're talking about, the wounds that you're talking about, the stories mostly that we hold about those wounds and the way they're stored in our physical body and our energy body. So I always recommend to all of my students when they're having blockages on this level, they should have psychotherapy first with somebody who understands trika psychology because normal psychotherapy, I'm not a great fan, to be honest. But if they understand trika psychology or some, maybe somebody's made up their own version of Dallas psychology out there, I don't know about it, then they're going to be addressing these issues at the core level. And that will then clear the way, yes, like you're saying, and it's a have good meditation, to be able to relax into one's mind and essence more beautifully with equanimity. It's what holds us back, right, is um, these rambling thoughts which are producing emotions. In Trika psychology, we say we have um, AEF, or in English, automatic emotional facilitation. And that we have a baseline of emotion that's always being produced on top of the base of our true nature. This baseline is always vibrating. And this is what, um, this is what uh, Patanjali in yoga was talking about, Chitta Svritti. Yes, Sukhali? 
Okay. So um, that baseline is always there. It keeps us from knowing our true nature. Now, the preparatory phases of tantric yoga and meditation have what are called preliminary and foundation practices. And we teach them in my system, of course. And that helps everybody work through those. But for the ones that are sticking, that need psychotherapy, I always encourage people to have sessions with Susie or whatever, because I think, like you said, it will definitely create an obstacle towards meditation being easy. If you can push yourself through the meditation and maybe 10 or 20 years later, you're doing well and you've processed all of it out, but what a hard way to do it. What a journey, you know? <laughs> now, my wife had something to add on that. Yeah. So that's relevant now. Um, Sukalia, did you all hear what she said? No. She said, uh, when students first get into meditation and they haven't addressed this or deeper psychological issues, they start to go deep in their mind and relax, and then all this can come out. All the emotions can come out and become a tremendous obstacle for them in the spiritual path. And they buffer, right? They want to buffer it. In fact, there are meditation traditions like I can think in Thailand when the monks would tell you to meditate. If something comes up, they say, just push it away. Just don't bother, you know. And it could be trauma. It could be wounding. It could be your own conceptions that you're holding around negativity, whatever. Emotions, those things you have to work through. And buffering them by dissociating from them is not a way to deal with them. Also, continually trying to sit down and meditate while it's all coming out may not be the best way to deal with it either. In fact, I don't think it is. I don't think it's very efficient. I don't think it's very kind to yourself. But I understand that if people don't have methodologies to deal with it, then what are they going to do, right? Is that what you mean, honey? Yeah. Yeah. And so she's making the point, which is a very good point, that going directly into meditation is really not the first step for people with this issue. Uh, it, it causes buffering. It causes dissociation, spiritual bypassing. I think it makes all these things worse. And my guru used to tell me, my first Indian guru was a great psychologist. He used to tell me um, it creates spiritual schizophrenia. You know, you're developing the spiritual side. And at the same time, you're repressing and pushing away all of the emotional, mental things that have to be worked on because they're too disturbing to your meditation and to your spiritual image of yourself and so on, upsetting your equanimity. But all that's contrived equanimity. The spiritual image and the equanimity is all contrived. we got to deal with the emotions. So the first step shouldn't be meditation. First step should be get in the yoga studio with a tantric yogini like Eleni and Sumi or Sumanasa, Suzy and us here and learn to work with your body. Breathe, feel, open, accept. Forget about the high esoteric stuff for now. Be with your body, and then the emotions will come. And that's when I used to teach yoga in this way. Uh, I used to see people end up on the floor crying or, you know, having emotional cathartic moments sometimes because they had been repressing so long, and they finally gave in, and it all would surface. So I think that is the proper place to start. Like my wife's saying, I don't think it's proper to start with meditation for those people, right? Those people, most of us. <laughs> I think this is true. We all started like this. You know, we had to learn. So I learned meditation when I was uh, the first time when I was 12. And then, so in some ways, I was learning meditation and how to cope with emotions at the same time. And it was a very strange learning curve, you know, because they, they didn't go together really well until I understood them better and could make them work together. So I think everybody could benefit from this kind of thing. Yeah. Now, honey, there's a lot of uh, questions in the sidebar. Susie, there's a lot of questions in the sidebar. Did you see them? I did. Do you want to hear them? Do you want to address them another time? I'm okay with time if you are. Yeah, absolutely. It's better um, to handle them now. Unless other people live audience question first, I think is important. Okay. Anybody live still? I mean, I know you're alive. Anybody live question? No? Okay. So let's see. Let's go down the line here. What do we have? So what, do you recommend? Yeah. what do you recommend when fear anxiety is so cute? It feels impossible to practice. Oh, yeah. Well, then how are you defining practice? Because what we do when we're a spiritual practitioner, like Crystal's talking about, then what you do is what everybody else should do. When fear and anxiety is up, that, that's what you're practicing with. You don't have to try to push into a high-level meditation or something. You work directly with what's going on. So you lay down in the yoga nidra and feel it. 
or you go into an exercise routine and move the energy, or you go and do some yoga practice and explore it. We have to be a little bit brave to say, I wonder, you know, like get like an adventure spirit in our mind. I wonder what it would be like if I just relax and experience this fear instead of reacting to it, instead of trying to suppress it, instead of trying to fix it right away, you know, because that's all just ways of avoiding it. What would it feel like if I just let it overtake me? Now, I'm going to tell you this, everyone who's listening, yes, I was a professional fighter and I lived in a tough neighborhood and I'm a pretty tough person, but I am a fear-based Enneagram personality number. So I know fear. I mean, I was born with fear, tons of it. So I know what I'm talking about. I had to work through it. And you don't work through it by being tough. You don't work through it by pushing it down. You work through it by being with it in a gentle, accepting terrorizing way. <laughs> you have to just accept it because you have to accept it to the point where you realize it can't kill me. It won't change me. It's the thing I'm making up in my mind, really. That's the breaking point that you have to get to. For that, all you need is a desire that's stronger than the fear to get out of the fear. And to get out of it, you got to go in it. The only way out of it is to go through it. You know, and I remember a breakthrough I had in my mind when I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11. I I think it was like 10 and I was walking to school and the bully on the corner at the house on the corner of our block, there was no way to get around. I had to go past that to get to school. I couldn't go any other way. Was out there waiting for me, you know, waiting for me that morning. I was like, oh, here we go again. And I just remember thinking, I'm, I'm just so terrorized. I remember feeling my fear. There's about 10 houses, you know, from mine to his. Feeling that fear and every step was, oh my God, it's so strong. I just can't take this anymore. And I remember thinking, I can't take this anymore. I'm just going to go up to him and go, go ahead. Like, I just had a surrender moment. Like, I'm just going to go up and say, I can't take this fear in my mind. I was like, I can't handle this anymore. I'm going to walk up to him and go ahead, take your best shot, do whatever, because you do it anyway. And I realized he's going to do it anyway. So I'm just going to have all this fear generated. What's the use of that? So I'm just going to let go. And it may be a crazy example. Certainly, I was driven to the point of this kid was a serious bully. Like, in today's schools, he probably would be in jail. <laughs> you know, but like in back then it was kind of normal and you had to be a tougher person back then. But what I discovered was no matter how tough I posed and no matter how I tried to resist it or run away or try to fight him, the fear was still there until I finally confronted it in a way that I accepted it. Confrontation is only the beginning. It has to be accepted. It has to be connected to and embraced. Let it wash over you and through you. And then it's like, well, it wasn't so bad. That's actually what my experience was. And when he saw that he didn't have the effect on me anymore like that, it was no fun for him. He amped it up and I just knew I was free because I had him at that point. And we can all have our own fear bully at that. We can all have our own fear bully under our control the same exact way by looking through it, by just letting it wash over us and realize, I think I made up a lot of that or all of it. And that's what happens when you do these exercises. You start to get space. You get enough space to see okay, I think I did make that up. You know, I think I am making up extra fear here. It's not really necessary. It doesn't help. It's not even present with my situation. But we can only do that rational exercise with ourselves once we've evoked the energy and transformed it a bit because the energy is very strong when it's up. It's like Crystal saying, what do you recommend when the fear anxiety is so acute? First of all, you got to relax. That's the practice you need right away is relax. So either it's a laying down yoga nidra exercise of relaxation or whether it's the face, shoulders, and belly, or deep breathing in and out of the belly, it's another fantastic way to relax. Relax your face. Relax your shoulders. Relax your belly. And do what we call double kumba breathing, right? Fill the belly. Fill the chest. Empty the chest. Empty the belly. Fill the belly. Fill the chest. Empty the chest. Empty the belly. Fantastic exercise. And as I relax and just focus on that, again, the story goes away. The fear goes down. I'm not a character in this story anymore. Voila, I'm out of fear. I'm now in the qualities. I might even be able to transform it into the virtue in that moment and touch my base. And every time I do that, I develop more and more of a deep groove to be able to do that in a more stressful and more stressful situation. So what I recommend when fear and anxiety is acute, go with it and work with it, just like we described. Right? That's connected to our one farther down too. Is it possible to connect to the base in the midst of acute fear? So we just covered that, okay? And then, um, let's see, uh, Natalie, to everyone, 
What is the best advice so we don't buffer the negative emotion, thinking we are advancing in the practice and being non-reactive? I would say that maybe only practicing, practicing, practicing these practices, second attention, the story exercise, centering, etc. We learn how to catch ourselves, not to buffer, to not buffer. Would that be correct? That's correct, Natalie. Exactly like I just described, your question is what I just described. Um, you don't want to buffer. You don't want to spiritually bypass or psychologically bypass. It's, uh, we want to be, you know, we're born here in the school of life. Take the curricula. You know, we want to be here. Experience everything fully. It's not going to dominate you. It's not going to control you. Your mind is the ultimate controller. Your mind is the ultimate controller of your experience. Relax enough to allow your natural mind to come forward. It will take practice. Everybody who's listening and who's watching the recording, don't be upset if you don't master this right away. We're way too hard on ourselves. Mastery is like, you know, here's a quick story on mastery. I said to my Kung Fu teacher one sunny day in the summer in Chinatown, New York City, my home, I said, what's the difference between, you know, you and the masters? So my teacher was already really great. But we had other masters who were older in your 70s and 80s in the Kung Fu school. What's the difference between you and them? Because we have different terms we use for them. Teacher versus master in Chinese, right? And he said, he looked at me and he said, 25 years. <laughs> That's all he said. And I was like, oh, so you just keep plugging at it and things happen, right? Yeah. So let's not be putting so much pressure on ourselves to be so masterful with this right away. The most important thing you can do, and I want to really drill this home for everybody listening, is to not equivocate about using these practices, not wonder whether you should do them, not wonder whether you're going to be good at them, not wonder when you should start them. Don't set your alarm for Monday. Do them as soon as we get off of this little video. As soon as you hear this video, just do it right away. And you've already stepped towards freedom. You've already stepped towards healing, right? So Paralyze yourself too much. Okay. Do you agree? I agree. Okay. <laughs> so we do another question from the group here, or do we want to go for the one written down? Dharma, it's Eleni again. Can I Hi, ask Eleni. another question? Of course. Um, and maybe this is one for Susie as well. Um, but in terms of a um, psychotherapeutic pr process, or um, like if you're a psychotherapist and you're practicing trigger psychology, how do you help people connect to base if they haven't already had some kind of spiritual practice or yoga practice? Would it be, would the entry point be in through an asana practice, a general like physical practice? Um, because a lot of people don't believe that there is an unchangeable, unmovable aspect of themselves that's, you know, compassionate and loving. So how do you help people connect to base when, um, they don't have any spiritual practice or haven't had an experience of that within themselves. Does that make sense? Total. Susie? Mm. I don't see it as my job to help people connect to base. I offer practices, be that the physical practices or the mental energetic practices to help them be present with whatever it is that they're experiencing. Um, as somebody who's on this path myself, who doesn't reside in base, I can only lead people towards what I believe is a very organic process. So because I have so much trust and faith in the evolution of these practices, um, I'm not really thinking about that when I'm working with people. I'm more focused on the kinds of things that we're talking about here today. Um, whether that's establishing them in a yoga nidra practice or taking on a kind of kundalini hatha yoga that we know is going to be transformative or, um, you know, uh, teachings on Ayurveda. And then I kind of let base do its thing. And the people who are able to connect to it, which again is everyone, if they're able to relax into the process, um, will feel that progression themselves. And I do think that Eleni's question is very good, though, and very relevant. I really do, because I know exactly what you're saying, Eleni. People say, okay, so I'm buying all this, but I really don't believe that there's any base below this where I won't experience loneliness, sadness, fear. How do I know? 
And your question about how do you connect them to the base? Well, this begs a bigger question, right? And that is, first of all, connecting someone to the base is impossible. We, we can't connect someone else to the base. That's a, a spiritual mystery that occurs, basically, that we all have the capacity for and the potential for, but we can't manipulate it to happen. And that's why spiritual charlatans out there, gurus and lamas that are charlatans, are racking people up, paying all this kind of money to go to their workshops and retreats because they're telling you, I'm going to connect you to your base, right? It's called Shaktipata in the Indian tradition and Lung Wang Ling Ti in the Tibetan tradition and so forth. And it, it's not possible. No one can connect you. No one else can connect you to it. But you can discover it yourself. So what I understand about Chika psychology, I'm not saying anything against what Susie just said. I agree with everything she just said. But I want to go that extra step and talk a little bit more about it. What I uh, psychotherapist is that your job is primarily to be a teacher. Primarily to be a teacher. To teach people, uh, view teachings, in other words, understanding how things really are. And then the practices to experience how things really are. That's how I see Trika psychology. But obviously, and that's the exact same definition I would give to a high level acharya of the spiritual work of yoga and meditation. Uh, a lineage holder's work like mine or something. But it doesn't matter, high or low, it's the same job. So if I'm dealing with emotional stuff right now, that's what I've got to work with. And what is my job then if I'm dealing with a client, a person who's having emotional difficulties, uh, I want to educate them that there is this space. But they say, okay, but I, I had never felt that before. And I said, that's fine. That's fine. Because it's not something that you can force, not something you can contrive. But let's try to point to experiences that were on the, the hue of it that you might be able to recognize. And I did that in a sneaky fashion in what I was just talking about earlier. I said, well, if you notice that your emotions changed and you could change that one and that one, and then what is the you that's changing it, that remains unchanged? What is the awareness below all that, below the story? What is the ocean underneath all the waves? So I'm trying to plant those seeds all the time, no matter what level I'm teaching at. So someone can go, oh, wow, that's right. If someone's really awake in that moment, they'll hear, you're right, there is a base because everything on the surface keeps changing, but that changing has to be supported by something, it has to be occurring within some space of consciousness. That's the base. Now I can't point to it directly because it's not an object, but the evidence is there for it due to all these other indirect means of knowing. We call pramana, right, in Sanskrit. Indirect means of knowing by reference and so on, by inference by outer reference and so on. So Eleni, I think it's very cool to take people through this exercise over and over and then they, and when they transform the virtue, the virtue that has moved, here's the emotion, right? You know, here's you, here's the person, then the story, then the emotion, then the qualities of the emotion. We're drilling deeper, then we get to the virtue. Now we're in the twilight, we're in the hue of the base itself. We're in the lovely, you know, radiant warmth of the base itself just about to touch the enlightened nature of a human being, which is what it is, the base. And you can say, look, right here, feel this. Feel that love. Does that feel contrived? Did you have to create that, what you feel right now? Is that contrived or not? And if you take them through the exercise 10 times in a row, seven, eight times out of 10, they're going to go, that feels natural. It feels like all I did was take away the other thing, transform its experience into the warmth, blah, 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 blah. And you mentioned love, and I generate a feeling of love, and I realize, oh my gosh, that's actually more natural. So they start to sense themselves that there's something below the contrived level. And then you only have to say, the fact that you have this flexibility and can change your personality expression from moment to moment, your energy of emotion you can transfer now, you've learned how to do that, says that there is an abiding nature underneath, which never changes, which is pure open spaciousness. But that open spaciousness is the virtue, energy of consciousness, of loving awareness, wisdom, compassion. Yeah. So this is how I try to point people to it. And sometimes I'll say, do you ever have a moment where your mind just stopped? 
you know, you're looking at a sunset and there's just such beauty. You're just, you know, well, you're just, just in rapture, right? Did you make that happen? Or did looking at the sunset trigger something within yourself? Was the sunset the beauty or did it make you feel something within yourself that was the beauty that matched it and maybe even eclipsed the sunset? This is a very important way to point out the nature to a beginner, but you don't want to try to make them think that you think you know your nature in an unbroken fashion like a realized Lama or yogin, because that would be, um, that'd be false marketing, right? That's what a lot of people do when they hear these teachings. But you as therapists can apply this in a beautiful way. It's just a little bit of what you do, not focusing on it all the time, because it can create a distance for the person if they can't feel it. They might feel upset, right? But this is natural, and I think it is natural. Of course it is. It's inherently within us. We just don't notice it because we're always in this contrived effort, mental effort, physical effort, emotional effort, confliction, constantly distracted from just the ocean of stillness that we are right there all the time with these virtues, right? So there are many ways to notice it. One of my, my again, my first Indian tantric guru said, when you're eating your favorite food, he would say, you're eating your favorite food and all of a sudden you receive the bad news. The bad news is coming. What does this favorite food taste like now? He said, Dharma, what is your favorite food? I think I said lasagna, you know, good Italian word, lasagna. And he said, what does the lasagna taste like now when you receive the bad news that your puppy dog has died? And I'm like, yeah, it would, it would, I wouldn't really care anymore. It wouldn't taste good at all. And he said, exactly. So he said, the experience of the flavor of the food, the good feeling you're having from it, is in your own nature. It exists, it pre-exists in your base. I was like, huh, that's so true. You love someone so much, you love someone so much, you think it's unconditional love, and then you go home and catch them in bed with someone else and you freak out, and it's over. You don't love them anymore. Well, obviously that wasn't your base, right? This is something that you're generating all the time. Right? But when you love your child and they can do no wrong, this may be touching the base. It may bring you to the experience of the base, you know? So we produce this experience. It exists within us. Sometimes we can point the person to that and say, well, you don't think you have a base? Well, check this out. You're producing this taste of your favorite food. You hear bad news, use the exact same example I used. It's a classic Indian example from yoga. And then they say, oh, okay, I see that. That now I, I don't feel the good taste anymore. I'm generating it. Right. And in that moment, you say, right. But what is the base that provides the ability for you to even generate that? Now, if you can just not look out at what you're generating, but turn your mind back to look at the base, then you experience that bliss, that expansiveness, the equanimity, the joy that you used to project onto the sunset, onto the lasagna, onto your lover. And this is very good psychology, I think, because we're getting people to look back inside to like understand that they generate their reality on a psychological level. It all starts with a psychological level. We don't have to worry about a spiritual level about generating reality right now. That's way too lofty. We can just deal with the basic important first step. We generate our own psychological reality. Once you give people mastery of that, pretty much your job is done, isn't it, as a psychotherapist? And they enter stage three out of 12 stages. <laughs> Sorry, I went too long on it, didn't I? Um, if you're connected to the base, are the steps of changing the quality still necessary? Or will the qualities, for example, of example, for example, of fear also disappear or become less dominant with only being connected to the base? Good one, Kelly. So when you're connected, if you feel you're really connected to the base, then yes, you still that would be stage seven in our 12-stage view of enlightenment, very high stage. If you're really always intrinsically connected to the base, those masters who are always intrinsically connected to the base still make use of these techniques of changing qualities when it's necessary, when they encounter extra energy in the emotions. But normally when you're abiding in your base all the time, you'll find that the emotion will arise and it will simply dissipate. Because abiding in your base, relaxing in the base, means that you don't do anything and that everything that arises is natural. See, the, the, the Chika psychology view on emotions is that if we didn't grab onto them and apply them to our self story, they would pass quite quickly within a matter of seconds. Every emotion would pass within a matter of seconds. And those, as soon as those neuropeptides ran out in the body, it would be gone, right? 
but we hang on to them. Our self-grasping, our self-story hangs on to them and generate more and more emotional energy, right? So those people are usually abiding very deeply in the base, like my masters, they don't have to worry about emotional transformation. It's happening automatically all the time. The virtue body is being displayed all the time. Anger is naturally showing up as clarity. Lust is naturally showing up as generosity, right? Hatred is naturally showing up as compassion. Fear is naturally showing up as courage and love, uh, and so on and so on. It's just naturally, the negative doesn't have to even come. Or if it comes, it immediately comes and immediately changes on its own. But that's because they've done years and years and years and years and years and years and decades of the other practice we just did of changing the story. Okay. Any more questions from the online people or people in the room? Nobody here? Anybody there? Okay. So that's good for today then, I guess. I hope it's helpful. Dharma, thank you so much. I think this is going to be helpful to a lot of people. Great. Glad to hear. I'm glad to hear. Where can people find this when I want to direct people to it? Can you make the announcement where on our, on our group as well, Trika Master the Yoga Group, tell them where they can find this because everybody want to, want to know about fear right now. Yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, we'll be posting it on your YouTube channel, I'm sure, but also in your group and my group. Okay. Now I see lots of people saying thank you. So many people were listening who didn't post questions. Okay, glad we could help all of you. That's lovely. So wonderful. And I want to say thank you to Susie for organizing this. Uh, we're busily filming video classes here for the website and doing all that kind of stuff right now. So we didn't think to do one specifically on fear. And I think that's really great that uh, Susie organized this. So thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.